And the first uh, speaker will be Dr. Rachel Thomas. Uh, Rachel is the founding director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the uh, University of San Francisco and co-founder of Fast AI, where she helped create the most popular free online course on deep learning, bringing people from around the world with diverse and non-traditional backgrounds into AI. Uh, she was selected by the Forbes as one of 20 incredible women in AI in 2017 and was profiled in the book uh, Women Tech Founders on the Rise. She earned her PhD in mathematics at Duke University, where she worked on mathematical analysis of biochemical networks. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, yeah, so I am... Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm a director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at USF, um, and this is because I'm concerned about harms due to misuse of data, including algorithmic bias and issues around, around fairness. Um, I also really see the potential of machine learning, um, and in that capacity, Fast AI, um, where our, which is a nonprofit research lab with the goal of making deep learning more accessible to people in a variety of domains. We really want domain experts to be able to use state of the art deep learning. We've had a number of radiologists take our course and are now contributing kind of cut, cutting edge work. Um, and I think we're at a really, really crucial point in time uh, where there's a lot of promise to be had for machine learning, but also a lot of potential risk and harms. And so we need to be careful about how we approach things. Um, and my goal, uh, my goal here is to, to help, uh, help widen and enlarge the conversation that we're having on, on fairness and bias, because we're often uh, kind of just talking about a narrow slice of the, the issues that are out there. The FDA issued guidelines last year on enhancing the diversity of clinical trial populations. Um, this is an incredibly important topic, and we've definitely kind of seen the harms of what happens if you, for instance, only have white men in your, in your trial. Um, and while, while this is important, it does not solve all our problems, however. Uh, so one example comes from Fitbits, uh, which are currently used in almost 300 clinical trials, and they provide you know, a cheap way to measure heart rate. However, Fitbits and other wearable fitness monitors primarily use a green light technology to track heart rate, which is less accurate on people of color. So the, the readings are kind of lower quality if you have more melanin in your skin. Um, and so this is, this is an issue where um, including people of color in your clinical trial, while important, um, is not going to address issues when the, the measurements are systematically biased, or at least uh, kind of biased towards being inaccurate. Another example comes from this paper from Zayed Obermeyer et al. that was published in Science last year and covered by Nature. And it looked at a algorithm that was in use um, in a real healthcare system impacting millions of people. And it was used to flag patients that were high risk and in need of extra support um, and extra care. And it was found to be biased against black patients. And here the training set had included white and black patients and the average healthcare expenditure of both groups was the same. The, the underlying issue arose because um, essentially the algorithm was using healthcare expenditure as a proxy for sickness levels. However, on the whole, Black patients were receiving less health care for a given sickness level. And so using, using spending as a proxy had a very biased result. And fortunately, this is something that uh, was resolved by introducing a new, a new metric. Um, but this is a really common, common issue in that we, we're typically using proxies for the things that we really care about. Um, you know, we may not have uh, we may not have the measurements for what we uh, most care about, and we have to rely on billing codes or, or other, other proxies. And so these two examples of the uh, Fitbits, um, as well as this, you know, using a proxy, are both examples of measurement bias. And it's important to understand that they're different sources of bias because they require different interventions. So the, I think, example we hear about most is representation bias, and this is what happens in, uh, for instance, the study we heard about last month where uh, uh, the researchers looked at what happens if you train a CNN on chest X-rays from a group that's 100% male or 75% male. They also looked at the reverse, 75% female or 100% female. And they found, not surprisingly, that a classifier trained on a really gender imbalanced data set of chest X-rays uh, resulted in a model that was less accurate for, for the other gender. A third type of bias that's really crucial to, to understand 
is historical bias. And historical bias is a fundamental structural issue with the first step of the data generation process and can exist even given perfect sampling and feature selection. Um, historical bias, I think can also be referred to as systemic racism or systemic sexism. And it's very pervasive across, across society, across different fields. Uh, we hear about it a lot in the criminal justice system and algorithms built within the criminal justice system having, um, having very racially biased outputs because all the data is so, is so racially biased. Um, I've studied this in my own industry, in the tech industry, the way that, that bias shows up in hiring, in performance reviews, in promotions. Um, so, so medicine is no different. Uh, we see a lot of historical bias in, in medicine, and I'm not trying to pick on doctors or medicine because this is true of, of so many areas of society. Um, there's a, a wealth of research on this around uh, gender and racial disparities on who, uh, who receives pain medication, who receives prompt diagnoses. Um, I'll just share a few, a few takeaways uh, with you. A meta-analysis of 20 years of published research found that Black patients were 22% less likely than whites to get any pain medication and 29% less likely to be treated with opioids. And this difference even extended to children with black children receiving less pain medication than white children for the same conditions. Research shows that doctors take the pain of women less seriously than the pain of men. And this shows up in pre prescribing less pain medication with longer delays and more often ascribing pain to psychogenic causes. And so there have been studies where um, Patients report lower back pain and the same complaint if it's coming from a man is more likely to receive pain medication coming from a woman is more likely to receive antidepressants. And so I was, um, I was invited here, I believe, as a researcher in deep learning and in data ethics and algorithmic bias. However, there's another area where I have expertise, which is as a patient. Um, in the past five years, I've had brain surgery twice a life-threatening brain infection, and several hospital stays. Um, I'm just going to share uh, one experience with you, which was in 2015 when, uh, when this all started. I had, I had no history of headaches, and I developed a really, really severe headache. It was the worst pain of my life. It lasted for several days. I didn't go to work. I was uh, trying you know, to stay in a dark room and not look at screens, uh, take over-the-counter medication. Nothing, nothing was helping. And so I went to an ER. And after, after many hours, they, they dismissed me and they said, it's just a headache. They didn't run any tests. They told me to go home and take aspirin. Um, and that was, that was very devastating. And to, to feel that gap between what I was experiencing and what I could convince a healthcare worker I was experiencing. Um, fortunately, I went to a different ER a day or two later where they did an MRI. As soon as they got the results, they transferred me to the neuro ICU and I had brain surgery the next week. On the whole, I think I've had access to very excellent medical care. I'm very fortunate. Um, yet at the same time, I've had a number of very, uh, very discouraging experiences of being dismissed or disbelieved. Domain expertise is crucial for any applied machine learning project. And in medicine, this needs to include doctors and patients. And so I think we talk, uh, talk more about the particular domain expertise which doctors have, which is incredibly valuable and important. But patients have a unique and distinctive set of domain expertise as well. Um, and that includes both knowledge about what they are experiencing in their own bodies, as well as how to navigate the medical system from a patient's perspective, uh, which can be, can be quite challenging. And I think this often includes, includes information that is not captured in any electronic health record. Um, so another area where we see bias is diagnosis delays. On average, it takes five years and five doctors for patients with autoimmune diseases, 75% of whom are women, to get a correct diagnosis. Diagnosis of Crohn's disease takes 12 months for men on average, 20 months for women. Diagnosis for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome takes four years for men and 16 years for women. And for many types of cancer, women have to make more visits to their general practitioner uh, before they are referred to a specialist. And so all this shows up in our data, and it's crucial to understand these biases, to understand what's missing from our data, what's incomplete, what's incorrect. Um, you know, in, in my story, I think about uh, all the MRIs that weren't, uh, 
you know, that aren't taken, the patients that don't, uh, don't persist and don't go to a, a second ER or a third ER or don't uh, kind of don't have the, the resources to do so. Um, and all that, that is going to show up in our data in various ways. And we have to understand, um, understand those factors. Furthermore, the, the medical system as a whole can be disempowering and even traumatic for many patients. Um, Aubrey Hirsch wrote a very powerful comic um, and I encourage you to look, at, look it up in full about um, her, her experience. Uh, she has Graves disease, but it took her six years to get a diagnosis. And by the time she did, she suffered permanent damage to her eyes, bones, and heart um, because of the years that she went, went undiagnosed. Um, she talks about doctors dismissing her as, you know, her list of symptoms must just be due to anxiety. She writes, I knew my body and I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't get anyone to listen to me. Um, kind of so many doctors tell her that she's fine, that she begins to internalize that and to doubt herself, even as she's suffering severe symptoms. Um, she writes, I assume that what happened to me was a fluke, that I had fallen through some crack in the system but I've since learned that my experience was entirely typical. And so, um, so I think those are some perspectives that are important to understand about kind of the medical data itself, about how patients experience the medical system. Something that's important to understand from the machine learning perspective is that we're seeing, and we're seeing this, I would say, um, more so in fields outside of medicine um, right now, but that machine learning is often having the effect of further concentrating and centralizing power. Um, and this is often unintentional, but it's something that I think we really need to, to be wary of um, or conscious of in, in trying to avoid as, as we use machine learning more and more in medicine. Um, there's an algorithm that's used in many of the 50 states to determine Medicaid benefits. And when it was implemented in Arkansas, there was a bug in the software code that incorrectly cut, uh, cut benefits for people with cerebral palsy, including Tammy Dobbs, who was interviewed in this Verge article. And so what happened is there was this drastic, kind of drastic cut in care for people with cerebral palsy. They couldn't get any explanation and there was no system of recourse in place because there was no system to identify or address mistakes. And fortunately this eventually surfaced um, after a lengthy court case but that's really not, not the ideal approach. And this is, this is a common issue that we see with many, uh, many machine learning systems being implemented, uh, but not having, not having a system for recourse. Another issue in this case was that nobody, nobody wanted to take responsibility. The creator of the algorithm, who is, this is a proprietary black box algorithm that he's earning royalties off of. He said it wasn't his responsibility and he blamed the policymakers. The policymakers could, blame the engineers that implemented this. And I don't say this because uh, it's not that casting blame is important. It's that we need to have a notion of responsibility to ensure better outcomes. And this is not unique to machine learning systems. This is common in all bureaucracies, but as Dana Boyd has observed, algorithmic systems are often extending bureaucracy right now. Um, and so some of the ways that ML can have the effect of centralizing power, of course, it does not always is that it can be used at massive scale very cheaply. It can replicate identical biases or errors at scale. While humans are certainly very biased, as I, as I showed earlier, um, at least there's variation across the population. ML can be used to evade responsibility, can be implemented with no system for recourse. It can create feedback loops and a feedback loop occurs when, whenever you're no longer just observing the data, but when the output from your model influences what the next round of data looks like. And it can amplify, not just encode bias. I mean, so it's good to be conscious, conscious of these risks. Um, fortunately, there's been some really, really positive work happening in the machine learning community um, towards moving our, uh, our conversation uh, beyond just fairness, which is important, but expanding it to, to talk about power and participation as well. Uh, Dr. Timnit Gabru, um, who got her PhD here at Stanford, uh, is one of the foremost experts on this topic. And she wrote in the New York Times, a lot of times people are talking about bias in the sense of equalizing performance across groups. Oops. They're not thinking about the underlying foundation, whether a task should exist in the first place, 
Who creates it? Who will deploy it on which population? Who owns the data and how is it used? I um, mean, these are really, really crucial questions to be asking. Ria Kaluri uh, wrote a great article in Nature last month, um, encouraging us to move from asking, is this AI fair, to asking, how does this AI shift power? And just a few weeks ago, one of the major academic machine learning conferences, ICML, was held. And there was a fantastic work workshop on participatory approaches to machine learning. And there they talked about moving beyond uh, kind of narrow definitions of predictive accuracy to trying to think more about holistic good decision-making in complex real world cases. Moving beyond transparency to contestability uh, because what good is transparency if you can't critique or contest uh, the decisions that, a, that an algorithm is making. And moving from explainability to recourse. Again, how can, how can those who are impacted by, by a system, uh, what sort of actions can they take to get uh, kind of changes to, to the outputs? And so I was very excited to see this work. I encourage you to check it out. I think it's available, uh, available online, the papers and talks. Um, you need to listen to patients to understand the ways that their data is incomplete, incorrect, and biased. Um, I don't think this is something that you can understand apart from talking, talking to patients. Um, you also need to listen to patients to understand the ways the medical system is disempowering. And so we can uh, hopefully avoid having machine learning contribute to that. So I wanna challenge, um, challenge all of you to think about what would it look like to include patients in all stages of your process and to do this in, um, in meaningful ways that are not just participation washing. And I'm gonna close with a quote from AI researcher, Deborah Raji. She wrote, data are not bricks to be stacked, oil to be drilled, gold to be mined, opportunities to be harvested. Data are humans to be seen, maybe loved, hopefully taken care of. Um, and she was writing in the context of COVID-19 data. Um, however, I believe this is true of all medical data and many, many other types of data as well. Thank you.